Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Royal Aeronautical Society. This evening we are having a, a, a lecture uh, organized by the Space Specialist Group, uh, of which I am the chair, uh, called the first satellite launch from UK soil. Um, <clears throat> Before we start the lecture, I need to make a few uh, housekeeping announcements. I'm sorry, very, very sorry. There will not be a fire alarm test in the building today. So therefore, if you hear a fire alarm, uh, please exit the building. Uh, the, the designated assembly point for everyone who is in this building is, is the paved and railed area at the junction of Hamilton Place and Piccadilly. Beyond, if you go past the inter Intercontinental uh, Hotel. So that is where we would have to go if we hear the alarm. The RAS staff will be on hand to guide you if you get lost. If you have a mobility or access issues, please, please make yourself known to a member of the event staff so that they can make necessary arrangements for your safe exit from the building. That is the safety side. Um, please leave, don't leave any unmarked bags or other items unattended. Please take everything you have with you. We ask you now to switch your mobile phones to silent mode during this uh, event. I'll do it here myself. Um, and the event will be recorded and then uh, placed on the YouTube, on the Society YouTube account. So uh, you can see it again or you could actually inform your associates, colleagues and friends that this is the, the event you attended. After the presentation, there will be an opportunity for questions. If you'd like to, like to ask a question, we'll ask you to come to stand up to the microphone up there. The lecture will close at 7 o'clock this evening and will be followed by a reception. And it's called the November London Space Network Drinks Event, which will take place, uh, I think, on the ground floor and the first floor, first floor of this building. Thank you. Now, uh, as an introduction to the lecture, the, as you all may know, the UK Space Industry Act received royal assent on the 15th of March 2018 and was a major milestone in establishing the environment for safe, responsible and commercial operations from UK spaceports. At the time, we didn't have any UK spaceports. This was followed by an intense period of consultation regarding the regulations necessary to implement the Space Industry Act. These so-called space industry regulations came into effect in 2021 under the authority of the Civil Aviation Authority. In the next weeks, Spaceport Cornwall will make history by launching the first satellites into space from the UK soil, from what is, ref what is considered to be a regional passenger airport. So this is something quite extraordinary for the UK. Unlike traditional vertical sites, Spaceport Cornwall is utilizing an existing airport runway and airport facilities to launch into space. The carrier launch systems will be, in this, on this occasion, Virgin Orbit's modified Boeing 747 Cosmic Girl, which will take off on the runway, fly up to a specific altitude, deploy uh, a, what we call a rocket mid-air, and then this carrier will return to land the, the aircraft will return to land while the rocket will take its satellite payloads into low Earth orbit. This evening, we will be hearing not only about Spaceport Cornwall, but also from Rea Group and Horizon Technologies, because they are placing spacecraft, they're having their spacecraft launched on the first launch from Spaceport Cornwall. But first, I'd like to start by thanking our sponsor, Orbit Fab, for supporting this event. I'd like to welcome Mr. Manny Shah, who's the Managing Director of Orbit Fab UK, to say a few words. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Howard. Good evening, everyone. I'm kind of having to <laughs> kneel down a bit. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Manny Shah. I'm the Managing Director for Orbit Fab UK and Europe. I'm also the co-founder of the London Space Network. And um, I just wanted to say a few words about, um, you know, OrbitFab, but also um, my own personal experiences with the Society. Um, uh, the Society has a special place for me, having supported my, uh, provided a scholarship to, to uh, contribute to my uh, master's program at the ISU a number of years ago. So, yeah, the Centennial Fund, I, I must say a kudos to the Society for the amazing work that, that, that it does to, towards the supporting the next generation of talent uh, to, to get into the, to the industry, not just the space industry, but wider aerospace. So, um, yeah, we wanted to just 
comment on that. Um, so uh, yeah, Orbit Fab, who are they? What are they doing? How many of you have heard of Orbit Fab, just to get a sense? Oh, pretty good, good numbers. Yeah, Orbit Fab is a company, um, a US headquartered uh, in Colorado company that is focused on in-orbit refueling. Um, we, we've just established our UK office in June. We're looking to grow our, our technical uh, d capabilities here in, in the UK as well. Um, uh, uh, recently having uh, uh, been awarded a number of uh, contracts for through the UK Space Agency. Uh, specifically, we are supporting the UK Active Debris Removal Program, which very much is focused on uh, in-orbit sustainability. So um, what does Orbit Fab do? We are uh, building the in-orbit propellant supply chain. And when we look at any spacecraft, the way they currently operate, uh, they are, uh, carry the propellant that they'll need for their, their lifetime. So it's like you drive a car and you t take a trailer full of petrol wherever you go, and then when you run out of petrol, you just ditch it on the side of the motorway and then go buy another car. Similarly, if you uh, take, uh, take a plane ride and then uh, get to your destination and you just put the plane on fire, that's, that's how we currently operate in space. Quite wasteful, throwaway, and, and, and inefficient way of operating. So we're trying to change that paradigm and, and really make uh, space more sustainable and, and, and maximize the use of assets that are already up there. So we're doing that through a number of uh, mechanisms. Uh, we've, we've built an interface that we is being uh, designed into the satellites, more than 200 uh, spacecraft already into the, into the design of those. Um, and we are providing the fuel service in orbit. We won a number of contracts, including with the US government, to provide fuel in space, as well as a company called Astroscale that's doing debris removal and, and life extension. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just didn't want to take up too much time. I know there's an exciting talk by um, Melissa shortly, so I, I didn't want to take too much time. But yeah, very excited to see UK launch uh, finally happen. I've been following it for uh, about 10 years, and uh, it's good to see the actual uh, fruits of all that labor from across the industry come together, but also government as well as a, as a key um, um, supporter of, 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 of the industry and, and launch itself. So, um, yeah, and with regards to London Space Network, we've been running London Space Network uh, informal drinks in a pub, which is quite different to uh, this setting with, you know, quite, quite nice to be here and fortunate to have this venue um, to, to have London Space Network here. But, but yeah, please um, en enjoy the, the rest of the evening. And uh, once again, thank you all for being here. Thanks. Thank you very much, Mani. Thank you for uh, sponsoring us, and uh, thank you for m supporting the sustainability, which is our collective obligation. So uh, I would like, now like to introduce our guest speaker, Melissa Thorpe, head of Spaceport Cornwall. Uh, originally from Canada, Melissa moved to the UK in 2010 to study at the London School of Econo Economics, after which she worked on several aerospace development projects. She joined Spaceport Cornwall when it was created in 2014 and it is today the principal liaison for industry, military, government, media, public and schools for all aspects of Spaceport Cornwall. Melissa's talk is very timely as launch is imminent, but this has also meant that she isn't able to travel as she is needed for the critical pre-launch activities at Spaceport Cornwall. Nevertheless, we are very grateful that she's able to take time out of her busy schedule to be with us tonight. So, Melissa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. You can hear me. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's been an incredible few weeks, and I'm really looking forward to share that with you. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, thank you so much, Howard and Manny. Um, I'm so excited to be here in, um, in on screen. Um, I now especially really wish that I was there in person. Um, but as Howard said, you know, we are completely in our our launch campaign at the moment, and it becomes very tricky to to leave the county. Um, it actually is even tricky to find a place um, on the spaceport right now to even hold this. So I am at home. Um, and I'm coming you to you from from Cornwall. I also kind of wanted to um, 
like Manny say, thank you to the Royal Aeronautical Society for um, inviting me to come. You've been a massive support over the years for us um, at Spaceport Cornwall. We used to actually use you as a base when we come up to London and have some of our meetings back in the early days. So you really did facilitate a lot of the relationships that we've developed um, leading to the Spaceport today. So thank you very much for, for having me. So who am I? I'm Melissa Thorpe. I am the head of Spaceport Cornwall. I am so proud to be leading this incredible project to what's going to be a historic moment in a few weeks' time. Um, I have been part of it since it started in 2014. Before that, I was actually working on the airfield itself, looking at how we could attract different technologies to what is an incredible asset at Cornwall Airport, Newquay. I'm actually an economist specializing in, in aerospace and aviation marketplaces. That's my 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 background. Um, so I entered the space industry only eight years ago. I'm slightly more of, a, of an aviation buff than a, than a space one, but it's it's been a great learning experience as well as it's helped me kind of translate the space world to politicians and children and just the average person on the street. So I am quite, you know, glad that in a way I haven't come from a space background because it's a let me kind of be that translator as well. So tonight I'm just going to give you a bit of an update on where we are. Obviously things are happening very quickly here at Spaceport Cornwall um, and I'll, I'll update you on on where exactly we are in all of that um, and then I'm just going to touch on a few points about why we're doing this and how I really hope that we're setting a bar here in the UK um, that we will take around the world um, for future spaceports as well as the space industry and, and support some of these amazing technologies that are coming up to, to make our planet a better place. Um, and then, you know, obviously we're excited to have um, Emma from Rhea Group and um, John from, from Amber One to talk about some of the payloads that will be on this first mission as well. So without further ado, um, that's our starting point. This is what we had um, in 2014 when... Um, the email landed in our inbox saying you've been shortlisted as a potential spaceport. It was um, quite a time. Um, we were about to go to Farnborough Air Show, and some of you might have been there when this was all announced to the media. It was only two weeks before that we found out we were shortlisted alongside you know, our partners up in, in Scotland and in Wales as well. And at the time, we didn't really know much about what it would be. Um, and the first thing we wanted to do is understand how realistic it was and if the site would even be capable of, of hosting a horizontal launch in the future. So we spent a few years looking at the feasibility of that. We then spent a few years looking at the finances and getting the investment that we needed. Um, the Launch UK program was started by UK Space Agency to create that launch capability here in the UK and grasp that marketplace um, and they had a, pr uh, a grant that you could bid into and we bid in with a few different potential users um, we, we what the UK government didn't want was that build it they will come we had to come forward with a partner um, and our partner being Virgin Orbit which I'll, I'll come on to in a moment so we did that and we were successful with with going through with Virgin Orbit um, we signed an MOU with Virgin Orbit in 2018 um, and then we set about securing the rest of that investment package um, to basically upgrade what this picture is right here. Um, this is Cornwall Airport, Newquay, located just outside of, of Newquay. It, it was bought from the council by the, um, from the MOD um, about just over a decade ago, and it was converted into a civilian airport. And a lot of investment went into it at the time, upgrading it. And, you know, it's an amazing asset. It has a, a runway of about 2,744 metres long. It's one of the longest in the UK. And as you can see there, it's pretty much direct over some fields over the sea. Um, and it also has a lot of ex-military facilities on site that we have, as I call it, upcycled um, or repurposed to take us to where we are today. So the amazing you know, um, animations and graphics you saw that came out of the original Launch UK program of these kind of whizzy space terminals. Um, we don't have that. It doesn't look that different um, to this this photo that was taken back in, in 2014. Um, but that's the beauty of what we're doing. We are fully integrating launch into this airport. This isn't about shutting the, the civilian side of the airport or the other operations that happen. There's, this is about integration. And that's been quite an interesting learning experience, but it's one that we really think is a fantastic model to take forward because it allows you to create a launch capability um, for less money 
um, a less environmental impact, and it also you know spreads the risk. We were just one one activity amongst many others on the site so it's not kind of all eggs in one basket with our site the council own the entire site and all the activities go towards that overall um uh asset management for the council of, of the airfield and any revenue generated goes back into a Cornwall council um to to support things like um housing and social services so that's where we started um and this is our partner uh, Virgin Orbit, who I'm sure most of you in the room know, uh, especially if your background is aviation, it's a beautiful 747 that's been converted uh, and modified to carry a 70-foot two-stage rocket. So Cosmic Girl is the name of the 747. She's an ex-Virgin uh, Atlantic airliner that was pulled out of service to, to carry um, Launcher One, which is the name of the rocket. She is based out of Long Beach in California. That's where Virgin Orbit are. That's the rocket factory. She has had several success, successful missions out of Mojave Air and Spaceport. Now, Virgin Orbit's um, business model is, is quite different in the fact it's a mobile launch platform. Rather than at the moment satellites are built and they go to where the launcher is, this launcher comes to the customer base. And we will be the first customer base outside of the U.S. that she comes to and has come to. Um, I need to start changing my language because it's actually happening now. Um, so she's she's here. Um, and for Virgin Orbit, this is just part of this, this global expansion of the launch system across the world. Um, they've announced other spaceports in the future, in Australia, in Japan, Ajoita, Guam, Brazil. So they're looking at a series of spaceports around the world that they'll move to um, throughout the year. And we are um, going to be that first site. So it's been a first for them, not just the, obviously the first launch out of the UK, but it's a first time for them to launch outside of the US. So that again, that's been quite an interesting uh, learning experience for all of us. It's a, a small satellite launcher. Um, and we partnered with Virgin Orbit and they partnered with us because we were able to um, operate Cosmic Girl quite easily from our airfields. We we have operated um, 747s, especially over G7 last year, um, and it fits you know really well with our with our operations on site. Um, and we've definitely started to prove that over the last few weeks since since she's she's come to us. So I just want to go to to two parts of what's happening at the moment. Uh, and this is kind of my update section. Um, the two parts start with what we've delivered as a spaceport. Um, and what we have delivered is some facilities. Um, the beautiful thing about our site is we have a lot of, we had a lot of them in place already. We haven't had to do very much, but we did take advantage of a few opportunities. One of them being some remaining parts of European funding. Um, that allowed us to build a state-of-the-art um, facility called our Space Systems Integration Facility or our Payload Processing Facility, or PPF, as a lot of Americans call it. And that's that hangar there. Inside of that is a, is a clean room where the satellites have been integrated over the past few weeks um, into the fairing of the rocket. We never planned to build this building, um, but during the pandemic, half of our budget was taken to support the survival of the airport. Without that airport, we don't have a spaceport. As many regional airports around the world struggled in the pandemic, we've fully supported that, but it left us with a gap. Um, and when I took this this head roll on, that was my first job, was to go find that gap. And I, and I did in the European funding, but it came with additionality. It came with the fact that we had to build a building that would that would create R&D jobs. This is what we came up with. And from groundbreak to completion, we did this in 12 months. Um, so it was an incredible achievement. We're so proud of it because what it's given is not just this amazing asset for um, Virgin Orbit to have, but other users in the future. Um, and that's what's really exciting to us is the, the queue of people coming to, to the site to want to use it now. Um, just sh just um, to the left of that image there, you'll see a, a block of porta cabins. That is uh, site offices for our new building that are, is about to be complete in March, which will be our space systems operation facility. And that will have office space, um, a few smaller clean rooms and lab space as well. So for us, this is about a kind of growing cluster of activity that launches as a catalyst for. 
Now, that is Virgin Orbit parked up in front of her, her new home. And she's there at the moment. Um, and the, it is now full of ground support equipment all around her. Um, and it is a bustling, busy sight. This photo was taken the day that she arrived um, over from California. It was quite quite a big moment for everybody that's been involved in this project. Um, and now, you know, it hasn't worn off that excitement. I see her every day up there and you still get goosebumps that she's there. It's when you see it, it's so big. <laughs> and we get that question, oh, it's not a normal vertical launch. It's, you know, how's it exciting? But you see that. And when you saw the rocket attached to her over the last few weeks as well, it's just so impressive and it does take your breath away. And maybe some of you in the room got to come and see it a few weeks ago um, when we had um, some tours going and it, it's, it's, just fantastic to have that up on site so from our perspective spaceport cornwall the buildings are ready and as i'm sure you've heard we got our license last week another massive milestone probably the biggest because that was the most challenging part of this project was was that space flight um piece of regulation um, all going through this we were the guinea pigs definitely um, and the CAA were absolutely fantastic at you know working through it with us it was their first time it's our first time and it was Virgin's first time as well so for us to get that spaceport license last week it was a big celebration because it it was it was so challenging but it should be you know it's it's launching to space and safety has to come first and i'm so proud that we you know got to the stage where we were able to prove that capability that safety as well as you know the environmental um credentials that we needed to get that license second um from a virgin perspective um, they have delivered all the equipment now over. So in quick succession, we had Cosmic Girl arrive, we had the ground support equipment, and then we had the rocket all within a few days. It was a busy uh, time in October. We have all the humans here as well from California, as well as some now that are, are living here and working on site. Um, so from a, a, a kit point of view, everything's there. All the humans are here. Everything is is good to go. The satellites, which you'll hear from in a few minutes, um, are all integrated into the rocket or into the fairing. Um, and we are just running through rehearsals and testing everything that we're allowed to do under the spaceport license. Um, we are now just waiting, which I, we are expecting in the next couple of days, is that that Virgin Orbit operator license from the CIA, um, which was always due to come after ours. And that, again, will be a huge milestone for Virgin Orbit as well um, to hit that. So from a spaceport perspective and a Virgin perspective, bar the next couple of days of getting that li that Virgin license across the line, we are we are good to go. So what you'll see probably in the next week, couple of weeks, is some of these wet dress rehearsals happening, a few more test flights, and then you'll start to hear some public talk about an actual launch date, which I'm sure will be on everybody's mind. And I get it asked probably ten times a day at the moment. Um, we are still targeting this year, um, and we're we're really motivated to get it done before Christmas. So we can all have a bit of a break. Um, and I just wanted to touch on a couple more things and then I'll wrap up. Um, our purpose here is space for good. Uh, this is our clean room inside that um, facility, the hangar. Um, and we wrote it in very big letters on the wall because this is what we believe in at Spaceport Cornwall. We want to harness the power of space for good back down here on planet Earth. And we wanted every satellite company that came through there to be integrated to have a reminder of why we're doing this. The satellites themselves, they're the superstars. And I'm really excited for you to hear from some of them today. We, the first satellite that did come in to be integrated um, it kind of blew me away that it was happening. And I know maybe some of us take it for granted, but the power of what, what these technologies are doing for us back on planet Earth, I never want that, that feeling to be lost. So we wrote it on the wall um, and it's a constant reminder of why we're all doing this. Um, and for us, that also includes why we need to do a better job at some things and Manny touched on some of it. Um, for us, it's about that piece, responsible launch. Launch is not sustainable in a, an environmental perspective, you know, at the moment. Of course, these satellites going up into space are doing incredible things and helping us become more efficient here on Earth and saving lives. We all know that. We're all really proud of that. But the way they're getting to space, that's what we want to do a better job of. Um, so we're about to launch our Road to Net Zero plan, which I know sounds a bit ridiculous to be a spaceport saying so you can be net zero. Our first target has to be carbon neutral. But we feel we can do that because we're, we have a great starting point with our operator at Virgin Orbit and the the lower amount of, of um, impact that they have. 
uh, and also the airport we're not building in the middle of a remote jungle somewhere um, but it starts at transparency as part of the licensing process we had to do assessment of environmental effects and that's number one there that's our carbon that came out of that impact but we went one step further here in Cornwall and we got the university of Exeter to do a whole life cycle analysis for us across the entire piece from the build of the rocket to the transportation to all the people coming everything because we wanted to see actually what's the worst case you know for us only then will we be able to target what impacts we can bring down and that's where we are at the minute we're starting to look at you know where's where's those engagement pieces needed where's the R&D needed so we can really start to to get towards a net zero site we're starting up a steering group just solely on this which I call my group of critical friends um, I'm not a sustainability expert I need people from all walks of, of sustainability whether that's in space or here on earth to to come together and, and help us do this in a better way and then we just want to back that up with you know action and intake and that will lead to integrity and then we want to go and challenge some of these other space sports that are up and coming to do the same and my point there is the UK it's done a brilliant job of starting to lead the way in this. Um, and I think the regulations themselves are a great benchmark. Um, and I think as space potentially becomes more regulated in the future, launch sites will have to do the same. We are the gateway to space and we have a responsibility of, of what we are putting up there. So I just wanted to touch on some of the things we're doing around, around that. Finally, the whole reason we're all here, um, this is this is for the next generation. Um, we, If we never launch anything, which, of course, we will be launching, but if we never did, I've always said, as long as we have inspired as many children as possible, not just in Cornwall, but further afield, to go into a, a career in STEM, then I will count this as, as a success. And we have just, uh, last week, we have hit... Um, our target of engaging with every single school in Cornwall. Um, you know, don't forget, we've been doing this for eight years and this outreach project was our first thing we started. And so we have eight years of, of evidence of children that have gone into careers now. Um, our local college has started a, a science and space institute solely based on the demand from kids. That in itself is massive. Um, we have you know, I, I get stopped almost daily with parents or teachers telling, you know, me about how their daughter or their son wants to, to go into the space industry or to a, into a science because they came up and they saw the rocket at our outreach event. Um, and for us, you know, girls especially, you know, giving that, that inspiration and that passion, but also then showing them the pathways into the industry is so crucial. And my plea always with a group sit, sat in that room like today is is to, to, do, to do that, is to go in and tell them how they can get involved in, in your industry and, and, the, and the direct ways that they could do that. That's it. This is our mission patch for that first launch in a few weeks. Um, if you get your hands on one, then, you know, don't put it on eBay. <laughs> it's super exciting. And this just shows, you know, all the partnership that's involved between, of course, the US and the UK, but also all the other um, uh, companies and countries that have been involved from Poland and Oman to our friends up in Scotland and uh, our friends in England, of course, as well, and, and over with Space Forge in Cardiff. So it's a, such a great example of space because it's so many different partnerships and people coming together to do something historic. And that's what we're so, so excited for. So um, keep an eye out. Um, we're hoping to get that launch date confirmed probably in the next week or so. Um, and then we will We'll have um, a chance to get tickets. We will be hosting an event on site to see it take off. It will be in the middle of the night. It's going to be cold. But if you're up for it, um, then we'd love to see you down in Cornwall to, to take part of that of that moment. So apologies again for that technical glitch at the beginning, but looking forward to taking some questions in a bit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Melissa. Very, very interesting, very motivating talk. The fact that you're bringing jobs into the area, bringing, building clusters, uh, interacting with uh, the, the children in every school in Cornwall. This is very exciting. And uh, achieving your sustainability goals or, or being on the road to achieving your sustainability goals. Thank you very much for this very interesting discussion. Um, if you permit, before we move on to questions from the audience, I'd like first to invite Emma Jones up 
uh, the UK business director of Rea Group. Uh, then I'll ask John Beckner, founder and ch chief executive of Horizon Technologies. So Emma, the floor is yours for five minutes. Thank you. Excuse me, I didn't say the, the, both of these people have um, spacecraft which will be launched by, from Spaceport Portal. Spaceport Portal. Thank you very much. So um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm going to read this <laughs> because I've done this before and five minutes is not a lot of time to tell you all the exciting stuff we're trying to achieve uh, working with Melissa and the team down in the spaceport. Um, I'll tell you a bit about RIA just to start off. Uh, RIA is a uh, 800 staff, um, 100 million pound company operating in 11 countries across Europe and Canada. Uh, I run the, uh, the UK uh, part of the business, um, we're based in, uh, we're quite small, we're growing, uh, we're based in Harwell, and one of the major things that we've achieved uh, this year is to, is to create the Dover Pathfinder satellite, which I'll talk about, uh, and tell you a little bit more detail. Um, as a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and thank you, Howard, <laughs> I'm very pleased to be asked to to give you, a, a, a tell you about the mission, and I'll tell you about how excited my team are uh, that we've actually managed to achieve this and to actually be part of this first launch. Uh, it's, it's <laughs> I, can't, I can't ex express it. Uh, it's in, the, it's in the, uh, the office all the time, and we're really looking forward to the launch. So the Dover Pathfinder mission uh, aims to demonstrate secure uh, GNSS resilience, that's global navigation resilience from low Earth orbit, and I've put a section in here. In other words, <laughs> we are trying to demonstrate a backup to GPS uh, to ensure that all critical national infrastructure in the UK or abroad uh, in other countries uh, remains, a ru uh, remains running when there's a problem with GPS. And you, the, some of the issues that happen with GPS, occasionally it fails, so mostly it's jammed occasionally. Uh, there are issues with it, and there's no backup. And from the Blackett report, it's been noted that it would cost the UK about a billion a day in terms of uh, revenue costs issues. Uh, it would stop ambulances, for example, working out where people are. So all of these things are, are, are critical to the national infrastructure of the UK. And this is an opportunity for us to develop a solution to provide a, a backup. So as noted in several government reports, the solution is a system of systems approach. So we've been working with the MPL, I provide uh, the, uh, the ground timing capability, but the key part of the system is to have a resilience, uh, a system for resilience and secure, um, uh, reliable low Earth orbit uh, position navigation and timing system or PNT. And that's what we've done. So the Dover Pathfinder mission, revolves around uh, a rear UK designed waveform that we've come up with. Uh, it's an innovative waveform uh, that allows us to actually be agile across frequency and actually agile across uh, threats. Um, and we can tip and queue from other systems to actually allow us to move, move around the spectrum in order to be able to continue service, PNT service, in quite difficult circumstances. So to test this waveform, we needed to have some capability in space and we work with Open Cosmos, who have been uh, exceptionally in, in carrying out all of the assembly, integration, and test of the satellite, and incorporating our payload into the satellite itself. Uh, they're also based at Harwell, so this is a very UK, <laughs> UK adv adventure. And we produced the Dover Pathfinder satellite, which we took down to Cornwall and integrated with the payload adapter on the Virgin Orbit uh, launcher, Launcher 1. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, which was quite an, uh, quite an amazing uh, experience in itself, because you don't normally get to do that when you work in space, uh, actually standing next to the payload adapter with the actual satellite. So it's quite unique. And then outside the door is the actual <laughs> the, uh, the thing that's going to take it to space. Doing that all in the UK is, uh, is quite remarkable. So Dover is a, is a Pathfinder satellite, so we are actually using it as a test bed. Uh, it's a 3U CubeSat. It's going to be the UK's first fully indigenous global positioning satellite. So we're quite proud of that. Um, and we're grateful to UKSA and ESA for supporting uh, Rear UK's fund, co funding of this uh, under the NAVIS 2 uh, 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 funding line. 
We're also grateful to Virgin Orbit and to Spaceport Cornwall uh, for providing the launch slot opportunity, uh, which we <laughs> negotiated some time ago. Um, but held, we've held on to that, and uh, we're grateful to Virgin for doing that for us, and uh, to Spaceport Cornwall for some, providing some excellent uh, facilities for uh, integration in, new, in Newquay. So we look forward to the upcoming launch. And my team is really excited to get on with it, launch it, be part of this first launch out of the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Very, very interesting. Um, so, and now we have uh, John Beckner to speak for us for five minutes. Thank you, John. Five minutes. Okay. We're going to try to cut this short. Uh, John Beckner, Horizon Technologies. Uh, we're not 800 people. Um, we're seven in Reading, but we're, we're growing. Okay. So that's a start. I do want to thank the society um, for the invitation tonight. Uh, the last time I was here, and this will date me, was in the 90s. And it was an event for my colleague, uh, Group Captain Willie Wilson, who is deceased, who had the world speed record before Chuck Yeager in a Gloucester Meteor. So I'm definitely dating myself, but there was a function here, and Willie was quite enjoyable. To give a little bit of background uh, where we are, um, I was just a consultant with an um, accountancy in the UK. I was selling aircraft, SIGINT aircraft, uh, for, L for L3 Harris in Greenville. Um, the former E-Systems. I was in South Africa, and um, they had big problems with pirates, okay? The pirates were coming down 2011, 2012, trying to actually offer the South Africans some Project Liberty aircraft, uh, like Shadow in the UK, to combat pirates, because they have C-47s, um, Dakotas, to, for maritime surveillance. So in the course of that, I asked the American guys, I said, how do these pirates communicate? Satellite phones. Oh, okay. I guess I know what that is. Okay. Um, well, how do we find something to locate them and find pirates? Ooh, that's tricky. Um, there's an American system that's not ITARS. It's just not exportable. It's five eyes only. So there, no one's getting that. But there's a little company in Tewksbury called L3TRL who does make stuff that does that. Okay. I go to TRL and I said, I need this box you guys have for the police. I need it in airplanes. We do Army stuff. If you want to put it in an airplane, put it in an airplane. So what I did over the past six or seven years is I took that technology from L3 in Tewksbury, put it in a box, and I call that flying fish. And we make flying fish. We do about three or four million pounds a year out of Reading. We don't even have a marketing guy. It's me and the COO of that big segment, OK? We, we have a lot of manned aircraft, OK? So we have. Well, let's not talk about customers. It's non-Five Eyes customers. Okay, the, UA, the MOD, this is public, does fly it right now on a leased aircraft um, near Ukraine. Okay, so that is public. But so that's the hardware business. And what I decided to do is see, can we put this same technology on a CubeSat? And what we did, and I'm given the short version here, what we did is we bid for a program called IOD. Um, in, wait in-orbit demonstrator. And Richard Lowe, uh, my colleague over here, um, is part of the satellite applications catapult. And the whole idea of them, of the catapult, is you provide a payload, we'll put that in space for six months, operate it, and then you get it as long as it survives before it deorbits, burn up, OK? So we were competitively, competitively selected for that, I guess, three years ago. COVID was very unhelpful to us. I always thought it wasn't, but it was. It really slowed us down. But we are, we're ready. The satellite is what's called a 6U. So just imagine two whiskey boxes or champagne boxes with, with solar panels coming out of it and lots of antennas. The catapult, Richard is one of the top guys there. You can raise your hand, Richard, because you're, you're important, um, is the program manager. OK, so we supply a payload. And that payload is an outgrowth of flying fish. So we're looking for L-band sat phones. And I'm also looking for radars. I'm looking for X and X band maritime radars. I'm, I'm going after pirates. I'm going after smuggling. 
Um, there was an article in the Telegraph last week that we helped with catching migrants coming from Africa, coming this way. We're, we're looking at emitters, and we're looking at non-cooperative emitters, okay? So it's, it's not AIS, which has to cooperate with you, you know, the, the ship transponder. I'm picking up their radars because they're emitting it, emitting it, not omitting it. And in fact, our partner on that is ESRO, which is the Royal Navy supplier of ESM software, not connected to ESM receivers. So they're, they'll work with anyone. Leonardo works with Leonardo. Talas works with Talas. So it's really a space-based ESM system, okay? It's really gonna be cool, all right? So when we launch, and we're very excited, um, when all those Americans come back from Thanksgiving, I'm one too, but I'm here for Thanksgiving, um, which slows things down a little bit, when they all come back, we definitely are looking forward to launching in December. Um, the Constellation is supposed to be 24 satellites, four in six orbital planes. Our first customer is the Royal Navy. It's the Joint Maritime Security Center with an E um, in Portsmouth. Um, the U.S. Navy's in the next office, so they'll get it too. And we, we hope to grow the business and um, expand to more than um, than seven employees, all right? So we're very happy to be on the mission. Um, find me, I'll tell you more about it. I've never really done a briefing before without slides, so this is kind of the, the hand puppet version, but um, that's what Horizon does, and that's what Amber is. All right, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, John. Uh, I mean, both Emma and John have indicated that, of course, we're all dependent on uh, spacecraft. You know, so we, our life depends on the uh, applications of spacecraft, navigation, communications, detecting of, uh, of uh, un unrequired transmissions. So um, the floor, we'll now open the floor to questions from the audience. I hope that we, uh, Melissa, I hope you're still able to hear us. I don't know if you're still online. Can I ask at the back of the room whether Melissa is online still? But in the meantime, why don't we ask, can you, uh, Emma, would you like to come up and sit at the chair there? And perhaps <coughs> with John. And then uh, at least you can answer a couple of questions. If, if you like to plug the... Um, the microphone, the cable into the microphone. Excuse me. So if anyone has a question, please come up here to speak in this microphone. You're welcome. Um, this is firstly to John around your technology. Um, I've heard of a company called Hawkeye 360. Okay, yeah. Is it similar to that? Where, where do you deviate? That, that, that's a great question. So, you know, Hawkeye is a friend of mine, John Serafini, the president is a friend. The way Hawkeye does it is they have clusters of satellites. So they're using time-based arrival on signals, okay? It's World War II technology. That's the way ESM is done. What we are doing, first of all, is taking, extracting data from the emitter. I don't radio map, okay? So because we know this from our SIGINT box, if I get a sat phone, I'm getting a GPS. With the right software, I'm potentially getting content under legal intercept, it's different than Hawkeye. Okay, I'll get four meters of accuracy. Okay, with the radars, we're geolocating based on the speed of the satellite, we know where the ship is, and geolocating on, on the ship, okay, or the land-based target, and I'm using MOD software to do the ESM. Okay, so as soon as I have data, Hawkeye's gonna give me a call, all right? Um, I don't know that I'll sell it to him, it's complementary to Hawkeye, okay? And here's the other thing. Our system is not commanded to pick up data. We are a worldwide vacuum cleaner, okay? 
the area we pick up, even with one satellite, four times a day, 12 million square kilometers. Okay, Hawkeye is telling, you know, you want to image there or get RF there, go, we'll fly over and do that. I'm just a big vacuum cleaner. That's what we are. We're a big vacuum cleaner. So we're very different than Hawkeye, and we're very complementary to Hawkeye. So that's the difference. Thank you, John. Um, Melissa, I have a question for you. Can you just describe um, the challenges you faced uh, getting through the regulation process? Because this is the first time that the CAA has uh, been confronted with regulations of this nature. Was it a challenge for you as well? We can't hear you. Maybe it's our end, which is... Uh, Hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Great. So, yeah, it was challenging for everybody. And I think the first time you do anything is always going to be hard. But when it's space, of course, it's that cliche. It's hard as well. Um, some of the main challenges I think we had was just communication, which is always a funny thing because it's what our industry does. But I think it's just communication between the regulator, ourselves, and the operator of Virgin Orbit and the sharing of information, which is tricky when it's US and UK. So the trade laws and the TSA that we had to get through and export controls, um, that took some time initially so we could start to share that information. Um, and then I think it was just an understanding of what's different in the UK to, compared to the US, where they've been doing it for 50 years and the FAA has a certain way of doing things. And the CIA has a new way of doing things, which takes some of that, but also adds some new um, parts to it as well. So I think there is just managing expectations. Um, and then as for me locally, it was the space board in itself. It was bringing some of, I guess, an understanding of the fact that we were an airport already and that a lot of what we're doing is basic aviation activity. Um, and so having to put the airport team into this additional um, kind of framework of, of regulations when they've been doing it in the aerodrome manual for so long, um, again, it was communication to them and saying, well, we have to show it in a different way uh, in regards to space and to launch itself. So it's been just hu humans challenges, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but we've we've got there now. And hats off to everybody that worked on this, which is a huge team effort across everybody. And I think the motivation to launch was always there for all of us. So I think, you know, that kept us all going when it got tricky. Thank you very much. Do we have another question from the floor? The microphone is up at the front. If you'd like to say to whom you are asking the question as well, please. Hi, my name is Anushka Sharma. Um, I have a question for Melissa. Um, what interest have you had from um, partners for potential satellite um, launches or people who'd like to um, launch their satellite into space from Europe um, further afield? And what are the prospects looking like for your business pipeline? Thank you. That's a great question. And nice to see you. <laughs> um, not on Instagram or on Twitter. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been such a surprise at how much interest we've had. A pleasant surprise. Uh, we always thought that the cluster growth side of things for the spaceport would happen around maybe year five of operations. We thought we'd get the first launch done and we take a few more launches to, to get to the point where the rest of the industry might be like, right, yeah, we're going to kind of shift and start to maybe move business or to at least launch out of, out of Cornwall. But the interest we've had in the last couple of years especially it has just been amazing and especially post pandemic where we weren't really sure what was going to happen um the facilities that we're building at the minute that are going to be open in march are full and we haven't even finished them the all the leases are gone on them and that's from companies from not just um, the UK, but Europe, American, as well as companies that aren't space companies, but want to start to get into the space industry, use the data or the applications from space, as well as academia. We have a partnership with University of Exeter now looking at environmental intelligence space. And then from a, a I guess, future missions perspective, we're looking at doing at least two launches a year for the next five years. Um, and I know, you know, most of those kind of 
Halo conversations happen with Virgin. So we're we are looking on that next launch almost near capacity. I do know that. So I think for us, it's just continuing to support Virgin with um, filling the missions. We have our own satellite going up um, on the next launch, Kernosat, which is our community satellite that we're building in Cornwall um, that will monitor the, the coastal health of, of, of the coast around us. So that's exciting for us as well. So we've had quite a diverse interest from all over the world, actually, not just the UK, but obviously we're here to really look and focus on servicing the UK marketplace because that's the whole reason the Launch UK program was established. Can I be really cheeky? Melissa, can you see the room? Yeah. This is a question for Emma and you and everyone um, involved in the launch. How many people in the room today would go to Cornwall to watch the launch? Put your hand up. <laughs> we need to send coaches from London. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Even though it's going to be midnight and dark and cold, and it's, you know, OK, that's good for me to know. I can definitely get some invites up to you. <laughs> Next question. Uh, thank you very much, all three of you. Really interesting talks, and it's fantastic to see the launches finally coming to the UK. Uh, so my, my name's Reese, and I've kind of got a question to all three of you. It's fantastic to see that actually a lot of the satellites are going to be on this. We'll be demonstrating novel technologies. Uh, could you speak more broadly as to what you think the establishment of UK launch, both down in Cornwall and up in Scotland, uh, what implications that will have for the broader satellite manufacturing sector in the UK and Europe, and what you think needs to be done to enable more launches and more development of novel technologies that can be demonstrated on them in the future. Uh, please. <laughs> Melissa? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for us, it's the fact that the UK has now developed this asset, and we better use it. I don't want another black arrow. <laughs> um, this needs to be a used spaceport. Um, and so for us, we're already looking at, you know, what is next? How we will we'll do our operations with Virgin Orbit, but who else is going to come and use it from an operator perspective? But also then who's going to launch from Spaceport Cromwell? And I think, you know, looking at a homegrown launcher in the future is really exciting, but also what's the government demand for a payload as well? So the government becoming a customer, I think, is something that we're going to be really interested in developing. And then the conversations coming out of ESA with, with the ministerial meetings this week as well. How can maybe the UK start to take a bit more of a role in, in any of the small satellite launches uh, um, coming to the UK now and becoming part of that strategy, I think, is going to be crucial, too, so that we start to tap a little bit more into ESA for, for launch out of the UK. We are seeing an appetite for launch or for rowing satellite companies in Cornwall at a pace that we potentially can't keep up with locally in a, in the turnaround of building <laughs> the facilities. Uh, we, we completed our hangar within a year, but that was because we had all the investment we needed. It was all lined up, ready to go. So again, that's my next thing to look at is how do we put investment packages together so that when we have this demand coming in for new facilities that we can turn it around really quickly and get people up and running as fast as possible. And let me just say as a, as a supplier of a satellite, and remember, our business is a data business, okay? It's data, I'm selling data, but it's from satellites. Our point really is we want the right orbits, okay? So if UK industry can offer us the right orbits, which we need to put up, pick up certain signals on the planet, I'll put them on a UK launcher, okay? Virgin's incredibly attractive because they do offer some really interesting orbits. Actually, not from here, but from other parts in the world that are very interesting, okay? But from a supplier, it's, I'm looking for cost, price, and what orbit is it in. Okay, so if it's UK, great. But if not, you know, I have to grow my business. So we're looking at where, where they put it up in space. Oh, yeah, oh, uh, Emma, please. <laughs> no, 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 I'm done. Um, from, from my perspective, the, the main thing we wanted out of the UK really is, is, is the enabling. Uh, we've been waiting, or well, I've been waiting 30 years to, to work with the uh, uh, a, a UK launch, and this is this is uh, an amazing uh, uh, opportunity. But where do we go next with the government? How do we actually uh, create the uh, flow of small satellites that's going to drive this? We'd like to help. Uh, we'd like to, to invest in the UK. We'd like to uh, get other companies to invest in the UK, which is what we're doing at the moment. 
and developing the business uh, so that we can actually start to feed satellites into this in, uh, into these uh, um, um, launch opportunities. Uh, and it's not just the launch in um, Cornwall, but also the launches in, out of Scotland, um, which would give us a different, uh, different capability. And as you said, uh, different orbits, different cost models, but uh, a good opportunity for us to actually develop our business. Grand. Uh, thank you very much. If I may ask one more very, very short one to Melissa. Uh, so I've been talking to a couple of people around the room today, and we've actually got like a fair number of un current undergraduate students here studying engineering uh, and some other fields. I was wondering, what would be your advice to current undergraduates who are looking to get involved somewhere in UK launch, either in a spaceport, in operations, or in vehicle development? What would be your advice to them going forward if they want to get involved in launch in the future? Yeah, great question. And something that we're really committed to down here in Spaceport Cornwall, um, and we'll grow that. I think from a starting point, we have worked really closely with UK Space Agency on their spin turn program. And I know a lot of my counterparts across other spaceports and launch companies have done the same. So it's a great entrance into some of those companies and we've hired some of them in the past and I know some of my colleagues have done the same. So that's a great program to start at. Um, also just get in touch. We're pretty friendly. So we, I think people hesitate sometimes getting to, in direct contact, maybe not through LinkedIn, but you know, all of us have info at boxes uh, that tend to get filtered out. Come and see us and chat to us at events. That's always really you know, a, a great thing to do. I think face to face is always going to help. Um, but there's so much opportunity, I think, coming our way. I think we're just at the cusp of this in the UK, and I think you'll start to see it grow. I know that we'll be looking at, you know, quite a few jobs up and coming here at Spaceport. I know Virgin Orbit are going to be developing their footprint here in the UK as well. Um, Goon Hilly Air Station are hiring pretty much all the time. <laughs> so even just down here in Cornwall, you have a lot of opportunity coming, but a lot of that is just, just get in touch with us. Um, we all have careers pages on our websites. Um, but yeah, a spin internship is always a great kind of starting point and it gives you a great scope across the industry in the UK. Wonderful, thank you very much. Any more questions from the floor? Yes, please. Uh, my name is William Gohill, and I'm a student, uh, first-year student at the University of Hertfordshire, studying aerospace engineering. Um, so I heard, so this is addressed to all three of you, Melissa, Emma, and John. Um, so in terms of reaching sustainability with the environment, what sort of strategies do you have in place to implement that in the future? That's a really good I've, question. I've, I've heard about, um, <laughs> I've looked into Airbus's Zero E concept aircraft, and I've also looked at um, SpaceX's um, concept of the electric jet. So I'm just thinking, uh, what, what way do you think you should go? go well, for, well, from our point of view, look, we're tracking things on the planet. So our, our goal in helping sustainability is checking, you know, pollution at sea, um, all sorts of illegal activity that is not good activity, okay? So making ships that they sail in a more efficient manner. Um, again, again, there's a whole raft of things we do as part of this, I think it's Blue Ocean or what does Virgin call it? We're part of that in the sense of the data we provide is a building block, block for that, okay? I can't say when we build a satellite, there's a sustainability uh, component to that. Right now we're struggling just to build it. So um, the data is where we would address a sustainability. From, from our perspective, um, if, you, if you look at um, what, the, what GPS is used for or what GNSS systems are used for, um, a lot of that is actually to optimize routes for things like trucks, aircraft, and reduce the, the carbon footprint of, uh, of industries. So we, we don't contribute directly, but we help to sort of reduce the carbon footprint of other industries. And uh, Melissa? And then I think from us at the Space Board, as I said in the presentation, um, it's supporting these amazing satellite companies to go on and do these incredible things for our planet. But 
starting to look at the ways that we're launching them. Um, so we're trying to look more holistically across the entire launch piece from the, the way that they're getting to the site to how they're integrated to then how, you know, the, the launch happens. So with the launch, looking at most of our impact actually comes from the transit of the 747. So if we can crack aviation fuel, then actually that decreases our launch impact by almost three quarters. Um, so you, where are those kind of big big impacts that we can start to work on? Um, we're looking at the, you know, pretty much every launch at the minute, bits fall in the sea, what happens to that? Um, we don't seem to know a lot about what space debris in the marine environment. Um, so starting to track that, we're looking at a project with University of Plymouth and Exeter um, on starting to look at, you know, what should we be doing about these these um, pieces of space debris in the marine environment. So that's one area. We're also looking at nature-based solutions around the sites. So we're working with the Eden Project to enhance the actual spaceport site itself um, to bring nature onto site, um, which does an incredible job of, of doing all this. And then Kernosat, our satellite that we're launching next year, will look at uh, monitoring the ocean health, where we're going to be looking um, to work with several environmental groups down here on um, rehabilitating seagrass around parts of Cornwall, as well as planting a kelp forest. Um, and kelp in the future is, is a great way of, of carbon sequestration. So we're we're holistically looking at it. And I know Good and Haley are doing the same from a tracking perspective. And as Manny mentioned, there's lots of activity going on from a space debris perspective. And as a spaceport, if we can enable those technologies to get to where they need to be, then, you know, that's a, that's amazing for us as well so we're at the start of this journey i would say but there's a lot of now where i used to sit at panels and talk about this a lot and it kind of fall on deaf ears i feel like in the last few years it's definitely picked up a lot of interest so i feel like we're starting to get traction into some of these areas um and i think that's really important for the entire space industry is to start to be a bit more account accountable about how we are launching to space thank you did we have one more question down here? Yes, thank you. Yeah, hello, I'm Chris Pocock. This is for Melissa. Where, um, where is the airspace that you're using for this launch? Is it a an existing range with existing instrumentation and tracking and a safety case established, or is it not? So the airspace is its own um, separate license, the range for the drop of the rocket, um, and that is being managed by Virgin Orbit. So I can't speak too much about that, um, but with the Virgin system, obviously it can go different ways. So each time they launch, they'll be um, applying for a different range license, depending on, on uh, what where they're going. Um, so for this first launch, we're looking at um, a license slightly south of the coast of Ireland uh, that will go through Spain and Portugal. So we've been working really closely with with all those governments in that in that area. But the range license is part of the the space flight regulations and is being managed by Virgin Orbit. Well, so they are responsible for arranging all the instrumentation and the tracking and the safety case. For the range itself, yeah, that's through the op operator license. Obviously, we we work closely with them from an air traffic perspective. Uh, no time goes out, and working with the CAA, um, and that's through through that as well. Well, thank you very much. I think we've uh, overrun our time limit this evening. Uh, very, very interesting evening. Um, it's it's fascinating to see that the re legislation put in place by the UK. Uh, space agency and the government um, filled a hole. The, the UK has many, many satellite producers, many, many uh, scientific people looking at uh, instruments to detect certain things, be they illegal transmissions or climate or navigation, all this sort of business. Uh, but what the UK did not have was the ability to launch its spacecraft from UK soil. And now this is opening up an enormous new window. Uh, we already have, as I say, a lot of small, small spacecraft industries, but uh, this new approach will allow people to get into orbit quicker because before they, the small spacecraft had to wait for a shared launch with somebody else, which took a time. And they say they couldn't launch when they wanted. So here you have a flexibility. And this will increase 
the uh, capacity and importance of the space industry in the UK. So this is a very, very important aspect. Um, clearly, we've heard questions about sustainability. Sustainability is the most important subject these days. And uh, all spacecraft will be, have to be treated in a way which is sustainable, which, it, which is, means at the end of their life they have to be brought down or they have to come down automatically. Uh, and of course, aircraft, they have to become sustainable as well. So that's it. this is the approach that we're all taking, where everyone is aware of these challenges and everyone is on the road towards meeting them. But I think uh, I've said enough now. Thank you very much. As, as, so as we draw to a close, I first want to thank Mani Shah for um, sponsoring this event. Thank you very much indeed. We appreciate your generosity. I would next like to thank both Emma Jones and John Beckner for agreeing to speak, to speak this evening. Uh, I wish them both a very safe and su successful deployment of their spacecraft into orbit. <laughs> and last but not least, I would sincerely like to thank our main speaker, Melissa. Uh, we wish you all success in the first launch from Spaceport Cornwall and, uh, and to a continuing series of successful launches in the future. So uh, thank you very much for spending the time to be with us this evening. <laughs> and la last but not least, um, I thank our audience, both here in Hamilton Place. Thank you for coming today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you at our events in the future. Please keep your eyes on the um, Royal Aeronautical Nautical Society events website. Um, certainly the space group is planning future events coming up in a routine fashion. Uh, those of you uh, wish, who wish to stay on, we, we, you are all now invited to move to the London Space Network November Drinks event, which is a long title. <laughs> uh, and this is on the first floor, so I think um, you will show us the way, Mani. Yes, thank you very much indeed. Have a very good evening. <laughs>